teaching mass. And so what I'd like to do is share with you, as I always mention, this isn't a, a, a formal theological course. It's, it's basically saying, what do I relate to this topic? How do I relate to this topic? And share that with you. Uh, so so I'll begin by saying, first of all, the Mass has been called uh, several things. And it's kind of nice. We always grew up with the Mass. But it has been the very first thing it was called this gathering of the followers of Jesus. It is the only, a mass is a gathering of the, of the followers of Jesus. And the first time it was called the breaking of the bread, which is related to what Jesus did in his ministry, including the Last Supper. He did the breaking of the bread. And in Luke's gospel, uh, the Emmaus, they recognized him, the risen Christ, in the breaking of the bread when Jesus broke the bread at Emmaus. So it was called the breaking of the bread. It was called uh, the Eucharist. We gather for Thanksgiving. It's a Thanksgiving to God because our experience of the risen Christ is that is that, that is a great gift from God that gives us life, eternal life. So we're thankful. So we're, we're here to be thanking God, to give offer thanks to God, called Eucharist. Uh, sometimes we identify the bread as your first Eucharist because that bread is such an important part of the celebration. Uh, so sometimes the, it, the, the very bread is called the Eucharist, but actually the prayer, the thanksgiving we're doing is the Eucharist to God for, for, for what Christ, he's done in Christ. We also call it the Lord's Supper. Now I think that is particularly interesting to me because the Lord is the risen Lord, the risen Christ. It's not Jesus's supper. It is the Lord's supper, the risen Jesus's supper. That's what we do. Because if it was Jesus's supper, where is he? And why isn't he saying the prayers? You know, it's not Jesus' supper. It is the risen Jesus' supper. He is the Lord. And so the Lord's prayer, the Our Father, is called the Lord's prayer. Not Jesus' prayer. But the Lord's prayer is inspired by Jesus' prayers. The apostles, Matthew and Luke, and the evangelists, when they wrote, formed by sacred tradition, this prayer. In fact, we know Jesus couldn't have prayed the, the Our Father because he didn't speak Greek. And it's written in Greek. <clears throat> now, did he pray the Aramaic version of the Greek prayer? Well, yes, parts of it. But there's a Greek word there called epiousios, which Jesus would not, could not have said because there is no Aramaic or Hebrew word even uh, called Epiusios. That is only the risen Christ. That is when it became clear that this is the super substantial bread. Now in John's gospel, we hear about it in the bread, that whole chapter on six. I am the bread of life. I'm the bread from heaven. I'm the manna from heaven. All of that's trying to describe what that Epiusios bread is, that that. That bread that is him, the sacrament of the risen Christ <clears throat> in which he shares our life. And that's central to the mass that we, we, we celebrate. We recognize him in the breaking of the bread and we take him into ourselves and we share his life renewed by this sacrament, <clears throat> the body and blood. Okay? So those, and then it became to call the mass. Now the mass is Misai es. What is it in Latin? Ite uh, misa est. Misa is about mission. That's the, the word is about mission. So why do, we, why do we gather for Thanksgiving? Oh, to feel warm and fuzzy. Uh, no, not. We do feel. If you feel his presence, you will feel peace. You will feel the power 
of his presence. It would be a warm and fuzzy thing. If you, if you feel that, if you sense that, you will, you will feel that warm and fuzzy. But is that why we are gathered here? No. That's not why he comes to us in the sacrament. Why does he come here? He comes to uh, uh, unite himself to us, but to empower us to go on a mission. And what is our mission? Or what's our purpose? It's his mission. We continue the mission of Jesus. The work of Jesus, the kingdom of God, we are serving the same mission, the same purpose as Jesus. And we are empowered to do that by our the Holy Spirit. We can actually do the work of Christ because we are empowered. So what's the purpose of this getting together? Warm and fuzzy? Well, kind of. But what else? To empower us to go out and be strengthened to do the mission, the work of Christ. That's what God wants us to do. So that's why we often call it the Mass. You know, we call it just by that very thing. We, this is what empowers us to do our work, the work of Christ. That's its purpose. Isn't that cool? So those, you hear those different words, how it was a, identified as this, the breaking of the bread, um, the uh, 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 Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, um, and then the, the Lord, yeah, the Mass. Okay, now, uh, remember that, so the, the Mass that we celebrate, this, this Eucharist we celebrate um, is the uh, Lord's Supper, the Risen Christ Supper. So how did we figure out how to, how to pray this? How to pray the Risen Lord's Supper? How do we figure that out? Well, the apostles looked back at how in Jesus's life. So to such things as the miracle of the loaves and fishes that we had today at mass, you know, that blessing and breaking and feeding that, that miracle, that sign, John calls it a sign. What is it a sign pointing to? Well, that Jesus is going to do that every fifth Wednesday of the month for eternity. He's going to break bread and fish and feed 5,000 people. Is that what is that what is a sign of? No, no, uh, no. It's not a sign of that. Because Jesus doesn't break bread and fish and five, feed 5,000 every fifth Wednesday or ninth, fourth, whatever. That's not what it is a sign of. What is it a sign of? What is that miracle? What is that great work of the feeding of the 5,000 a sign of? It's a sign of the meal that he will share with us as the risen Christ around the world. And we call that the Mass. That is a sign of this. That could only feed 5,000. What we do can feed 5 billion with his body and blood, much better than barley loaves and a few fish. Much, much better. Why? What will barley, five barley loaves and some fish get you? It'll get you satisfied for how long? For how long? Three hours? Is it gonna last three hours? Or are you gonna be hungry? If you're a teenager, it'll last about five minutes. <laughs> That's how satisfying it is. You'd be ready for enough something else. See? Well, how, how, so, so that has a limited power. I mean, it was good to feed the 5,000, but it's not what Jesus intended to do for all eternity. What he, that was a sign of is what he's doing in our mass. And that is feeding the world with himself. And how long, how long, how long would this bread of life sustain you? How when do you, when, how long does that, is that effective? For eternity. Even though we repeat it. One is enough for eternity. His presence as the risen Christ is enough for eternity. There's a difference. That's what that 
miracle was a sign of. And the Last Supper, what was it a sign of? What we do now. That this, what the, 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 the Lord's Supper, the Supper of the Risen Christ, fulfills what he spoke about at the Last Supper. It fulfills it. This, we are not doing the Last Supper. Because the apostles aren't here and Jesus isn't here. And we weren't invited to that one. We're not play acting the Last Supper. But we are fulfilling the Last Supper. Well, the Lord's Supper that we do fulfills what he, what he for, was foreshadowed. Because we receive his risen body. His life, his blood. In our mass. Isn't that powerful? I mean, that's a lot to think about. I could probably just stop right now and let you all contemplate chew on that. I mean, you can never exhaust, in a way, the meaning of this, the power of this. And to, to say, how do we how do we relate to this mass that we're celebrating? How can we how can we imagine it? Uh, I told you about the monk. At Gethsemane, he spent one hour with the liturgy of the word and one hour with the, 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 the math, the celebration of the mass prayers, and then one hour contemplating his Eucharist. Three hours. He had a three-hour mass every day from midnight to 3 a.m. in the morning. He was given permission. He was getting it. He was entering into the great mystery. And he lit up like a Christmas tree when he was talking about it. See, so he, he saw, he understood, he felt that powerful gift of Jesus. And, you know, one of the things I'd like to say for us is that, you know, we, we want to know how can we participate in this prayer? How can we be a part of it? How can we, you know, you can sit there like a bump in a log, like a log, you know, like some of the teenagers, it's like, when is this going to be over? It's boring. It's the same thing over and over. Not if you're listening. You're not. It's not. Oh, by the way, not if you're participating. Because if you do what this prayer does, there's nothing boring about it. Because you are praising God. Now, if you are boring, well, yeah, maybe the Mass is boring. But it would have to be you that's the boring part. It's not the mass. So are you praising God? Are you thanking? Are you thankful? How thankful are you? If you are really thankful, if you recognize what you're thankful for and you're thanking God for, that's not boring. Because you know what? You just remember, you're remembering all the gifts you have in your life and how grateful you are. That is not boring. And if you are listening to the word of God, you can, he can talk to you. Sometimes it's like he's talking directly at you. Like, how did they pick that one for the day? Hello, that's exactly what I'm doing. That's exactly hits me. You know, it can happen. If you're listening to the word of God and he's, you hear what he's saying, anything he's saying, that is not boring. That is powerful. That's a gift he's giving us. And if we are petitioning, if we are really praying for other people and ourselves, if we are really asking God to help us, there is nothing boring about that because you're naming real needs, real hopes. Right? And then if you offer yourself, you know, uh, if, you, if you give yourself to God, offer yourself, with Christ. You know, I've got this, uh, you know, you've got an illness. When you can try to handle it yourself, good luck on that. Or if you say, here, Lord, I've got this diagnosis, I've got this illness, I'm offering it to you, I need you to be a part of it. Help me, help me in, help me not be a crybaby. <laughs> help me not to complain too much. Help me to cooperate, help me to heal. Help me to heal. 
So petitioning God, being a, a making peace, you know, let us offer to each other a sign of peace. Do you want to be at peace? Do you want to be at peace with yourself? That movie we were talking about, that guy was not at peace with himself. He was not at peace until God, he let God in. God was able, and then he found a peace he could not fight, get in the world. He found the gift. Are you at peace? Do you want to be at peace? You want to be at peace even with yourself? Uh, that's powerful uh, participation. Uh, receiving, receiving the Lord. We don't spend enough time in it. I feel like that everybody's looking at their watch. Okay, when are we going to get out of here? When are we going to get out of here? When are we going to get out of here? I got other things to do. More important things to do. Really? More important, really. That you don't know what the heck, you don't know who's here. It's kind of like being a teenager and you don't hang around your, the old people anymore. Oh, they're so boring. You know, I got better things to do. <clears throat> Seriously? You are wrong. You don't understand the gift of the older people in your family, your parents being with them, spending time. Okay? Same way with Mass. You know, and we, you know, just to receive him and to be with him. An old man one time was sitting in the back of church, and in fact, he, and he was kind of something. And uh, this priest thought, is that guy drunk? You know, I said, who is this guy? Look kind of raggedy and uh, stuff. And he kind of went up and said, uh, are you, hello, are you okay? And he said, oh, 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 yeah, Father, I am. He said, well, what are you doing? He said, well, I am sitting here. I'm just sitting here. Lit looking at God and God's looking at me. I'm just sitting here looking at God. God's looking at me. Now he was praying. That was good prayer, wasn't it? Sit with God. Be with God. Let God look at you. Powerful, isn't it? And then, uh, uh, and then, re receive, and then sharing him. You know, that's the mass. We're sent out on a mission. We're gonna. How are we gonna share Christ with the world we live in? We've received him now. How do we share him? In what ways can we share him? That's what God wants to do. He doesn't want just to stay with you. He wants to be shared. In whatever way you can do it. So that is how we participate in the Mass. That's very, uh, I think that's such an important thing. Uh, in the formulation of the Mass, um, and that uh, teaching about what this Mass is, so God calls us not just as individuals, he does call us individually, but not never alone. He never calls us alone. He calls us together as his family. So when we gather for the Eucharist, we are gathering as the family of God. Um, and, and it fulfills one of God's desires. It's kind of like mama. Mama wants the whole family there, don't she? And we can never have too many, it seems. No matter how small our house is. Um, but it's like nothing makes her happier than all of us being there. Well, God is no less than that. He wants us all to gather. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the history of this, how the Mass started. So first of all, we do not have a videotape of the first, the day after the resurrection, the third day after the resurrection, the ninth day, the 15th day, the 15th month after the resurrection. We do not have a video camera of that. What did it look like? We don't know. We have written scriptures that report the first written thing, the earliest written evidence we have that they gathered for the Lord's Supper or that was in St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. 
about year six, 50, I don't know, 57, whatever it was. Okay, don't hold me to that. About year 57, so probably 30, 34 years after Jesus died. And Paul is writing back to the Corinthians. He was there about two years, I believe. And that was a very fascinating place to be. I've been to Corinth. And I'm going, oh, this is why he stayed here. This was the crossroads of commerce. It was a tough town, a lot of sailors. And you know what sailors do, don't you? They, they, they sail boats. <laughs> All right, and so, uh, but that's where Paul, uh, you know, in the Corinthian community had problems there. Everywhere you have people, you got problems. Sure enough, so it is in the family of God. So he wrote letters back to them. Well, thank God they had a problem at the Eucharist. Because if they hadn't, he wouldn't have written to them about it, and we wouldn't have known if Paul ever even knew about the Eucharist ever celebrated or was at the Lord's Supper. We would not know because we wouldn't have any written evidence of it. But thank goodness they had a problem. And Paul's addressing it there. And he says, and he said, if you, if you participate, and you know, like part of it was the rich people were eating a lot and the poor people didn't get anything, kind of, were left out. In other words, they were distinguishing between the wealthy and the poor in the family of God. And Paul said, you can't, that cannot happen because it brings condemnation upon you. You mean it's not just like going to McDonald's? I mean, yeah. Well, I didn't eat with y'all, but no difference. Uh, the Eucharist, what we do at the Lord's Supper, is makes a difference. In fact, it's so important that if you do it immorally, judge that, then you can bring condemnation upon you. Judgment. God holds you accountable for how you behave at this gathering of the community. We believe that the apostles after uh, the death of Jesus, they got, they were in that room, locked room, you know, we know that they kind of huddled together some uh, and various times they would gather. When they gathered, and they particularly gathered on the first day of the week, and they would have a meal, and they would tell the stories about Jesus and recall their faith and recall their experiences of the risen Christ. They would tell the apostles, would witness to what happened here. What do you remember? Well, what happened, you know, and, and they shared, you know, they would share scripture. I mean, well, that's how the scriptures were being formed. The New Testament was being formed by that storytelling and witnessing eventually got written down. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, bless this bed that I lay on. If I die before I wake, I pray my soul the Lord to take. Eventually, got, those stories got written down. But before, they were, they were shared at, at the, when the community gathered. And they gathered because Jesus had gathered them as his disciples. They were there to support each other. They were there to be uh, an inspiration and a, and a strength to, and, to, and to share the story, to not forget what God had done, to give thanks for it. And, and those meal gatherings, uh, they would recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread. That this risen Christ was not dead and gone, long forgotten, but that he was really in their midst, alive, alive, active, powerful. So, and, and so eventually these gatherings were organized. Organized by the faithful community, right? And said, okay, uh, we need to 
not do this slipshod haphazard. Let's organize this. Let's put, you know, let's do it meaningfully and faithfully. So Eucharistic prayers were written. Number three, this goes back to about 150 AD, we believe. No, it's number two, sorry. Hippolytus. Hippolytus witnesses to this, this Eucharistic prayer. They're, they all have old, well, ancient elements in it. But these prayers were organized uh, to, to uh, uh, remember what God did through Jesus to, and, and then to recall what he did at the Last Supper because you know what he did there is being fulfilled at the Lord's Supper now. Interesting, isn't that interesting? Yeah. And so in order to, uh, the first thing we do, of course, we begin the name. We process in. We, we travel there. Once we get in there, we, we begin in his name. And that is the authority. Why are we doing what we're doing this? The author of what we're doing, the one who wrote the book, is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He has authority to invite us to the Lord's Supper. And he does. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We come in his name. So that's what we do. We begin with his name. And then we do a penitential rite because, you know, we want to clean up a little bit before supper. And get us ready. Uh, we want to praise God, son. Glory be to God. Glory, glory on. Yeah. Um, and then we have a prayer that is designated for that weekend or day that collects us. So you know what you're thinking about? And you know what you're thinking about? is not the same thing when you come to church, right? Uh, you're thinking about, and that's not what he's thinking about for sure, or what I'm thinking about. So what brings us together, collects our attention, <clears throat> is called a collect. And that prayer is meant to collect. One of the other things is a song. If we're all singing the same song, we are now beginning to function as a collective body, you know? Have you ever gone into a party and that it's all that, just like coming to this room, all these conversations, I couldn't hear what you were saying, because all this was going on. And so a lot was going on, but we were not functioning as a body because I couldn't hear you, you know what I mean? Because there were more than one mouth going at the same time. All right. So part of the thing is to, we want to gather our thoughts. We want to gather our attention. We want to become the body of Christ. That prayer hopefully helps us. Then we're ready to listen to the word of God. And we have those scriptures and we respond to them. The responsorial psalm is a way, is prayers from the Old Testament psalms that is a, that is a response to God. We want to say, heard you. And hopefully it's a good enough response that we can remember it. It's a little bit hard to do it in a way because we get, what was, what was that? What was the sentence? Where, where, where is it in the book? You know what I mean? We need a little help to participate. But anyway, we stand for the gospel. <clears throat> now, why do we stand for the, the Old Testament? I mean, that's the Holy Word of God too. Ah. Uh -huh. In the military, when the general shows up, ten hut, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Attention, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Pretty good. Yeah, because the general's here. Uh, be attentive here. This is an important guy. You better be listening and pay attention to him. Well, when the gospel is proclaimed, the general shows up. We pay attention. We stand up. Then, of course, the homily's going to happen. We better sit down for that. Because God knows how long that's going to last. And is it going to make a bit of sense anyway? All right, now if we're going to do that. Then, of course, we have, and we're we've really running out of time. Uh, we Yes, I've already exceeded the time limit. But um, maybe this is to be continued or something. I don't know. Um, I would like to, at the end, uh, give a blessing to you, of course. Uh, but uh, if you have questions or comments or things you're interested in, I'd love to know what those questions are. We might 
set up another one where we go over this again. And it's, uh, so may Almighty God send his blessing upon us now, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.